You're listening to the Cash Flow Academy podcast with Andy Tanner, your source for investing made easy. Here's Andy Tanner. Welcome to the Cash Flow Academy podcast. I'm your host, Andy Tanner. This is where we make investing simple. And I, ha- oh boy, do I have a show uh, lined up here. One of our favorite guests, we have, uh, you know, we have people who come and, and share invaluable information and then we have what we call our uh, our repeat guests, our people who are friends of the show, uh, who come back when uh, when they have important things to share. And I just feel so fortunate uh, to to be uh, in in the circle. Somehow I've wiggled my way into <laughs> uh, with just some amazing people today. I know you're going to be excited for this, and I'm sure you've 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 uh, listened to you've tuned into this particular podcast because you saw who the guest was. Uh, we have Richard Duncan with us, and he is, uh, uh, I'll let him introduce himself a little bit, but he is uh, one of the people in the world who have a handle and an understanding of macroeconomics, as well as anyone I know in all of my circle. And so you can learn more about him at richardduncaneconomics.com. He's written, you know, books, uh, you know, The New Depression. He's written uh, The Money Revolution how to finance the American uh, century. And he has really taken me from a person who used to be quite dogmatic on uh, matters of economic theory to someone who has become very open to learning. And I've really learned from Richard the importance to looking at many points of views and, and shedding myself of dogma. So we'll talk more about, you know, he, IMF consultant. Um, you know, his resume is, uh, is, is impressive. But with that uh, introduction, uh, my, my dear friend, Richard Duncan, thanks for coming back on the program. It's good to be with Hi. you. Andy, thank you so much for having me back. This is great, great talking with you. Richard lives in Thailand. And I just said, how are things over there? And he said, uh, well, we have three seasons, Andy. We have hot, very hot, and wet hot. <laughs> and right now he's in very hot. And uh, so is this book, Money Revolution. It is red hot, and it's received uh, accolades very early. And uh, it's going to be an interesting uh, topic for us to speak about t- today. Uh, first, let's lay a little context down. Richard, for those of you, I've known you for years and years. I think we met in... I want to say we met in Singapore or Malaysia. I can't, it might've been both. And we, uh, we were with the, the Tans and we were in Singapore speaking. I think it was either Singapore or Malaysia, or maybe it was a tour of both. And I want to say it was 2008. So maybe uh, 12 years ago. And I've never seen someone outline um, economic difficulties the way you did. And then all of a sudden there's a standing ovation <laughs> that fills the, you know, it was like someone had hit a home run and you certainly did. And I was fascinated from that moment on. So we've known each other for a while. Give a little bit of your background, uh, if you would, please. Okay, I'm an American, but I've spent most of my adult life living overseas, primarily in Asia. Um, I, I went to Vanderbilt and after Vanderbilt, I had a lucky break and got to backpack around the world for a year. And I, I saw Asia in early 1984 and realized that it was booming economically. So I went back to the US and went to business school for a couple of more years at Babson College outside Boston, and then flew to Hong Kong and found a job in 86, uh, working as a securities analyst, doing research on um, many of the listed Hong Kong companies. And I've spent most of my career working in Asia since then, moving around from Hong Kong to Singapore and Thailand a couple of times each. I also worked for the World Bank in Washington for a couple of years during the years immediately after the Asia crisis in 2008, uh, in in 98, 99, and 2000. And uh, later on, I worked as the global head of investment strategy for ABN AMRO Asset Management in London, looking at all the asset classes globally. And along the way, I've written four books with uh, the new one just being released uh, this year. And my, my business now is MacroWatch. MacroWatch is a, visit, a video newsletter. Every couple of weeks, I produce a new PowerPoint presentation video discussing 
something important happening in the global economy. Fantastic stuff. Macro watches. People often ask me, Andy, what do you read? You know, where do you go get your information? And uh, I have a very, uh, you know, I, I don't read a lot of like Newsweek and stuff like that. I read, you know, Macro Watch. I watch those videos. It's one of my main sources for uh, information. I also look at a lot of data, but, uh, you know, data is data. I, I look to Richard as one of my main sources for learning and, uh, and for information. So it's, uh, it's fantastic stuff. Let me, uh, let me set a little context um, for all of you to be able to enter this particular conversation. It's a fascinating context right now. You know, maybe uh, I'll start with this. On my wall in my office, I have a quote from Steve Jobs that he talks about, you know, when he had cancer, he spoke about this. He says, you know, your time is limited, so don't spend it living someone else's life. And then he had three or four words here that really affected me. He said, don't be trapped by dogma, which is living with the results of other people's thinking. Uh, have the courage to, to follow your own intu intuition. And uh, when he said, don't be trapped by dogma, uh, that hit me so hard as, as it, it, it resonated into my heart as much as any words that have ever been spoken to me. It, it spoke to me. And I, I, in that moment of epiphany, I realized that um, if, I, if I presuppose a set of rules to be so with no investigation, and I just take it at, at face value with no critique, no second thought, my own cognitive blind spots can, can keep me from learning wonderful things. And so I used to be very dogmatic in my life. You know, there was, there was a certain way the world was, and that's it. And as I've grown older, I've really taken the opportunity to be open, not closed. And the reason I say, say this before we get into a, a conversation with Richard is there is no person in, in this circle of, of educators and, and consultants and, and you know, st students of economics that has challenged my beliefs like Richard has. It's been fabulous. Uh, he has a way of making me say, hmm, now I hadn't thought about it like that before. And, uh, and it's interesting. So I'm going to speak about a, a couple of things in preparation. Uh, the first thing I'd ask yourself is, how open am I uh, going into a, a critical conversation about the globe, the future of, of the globe, you know, in the future of, in my home country, the United States? Uh, how open am I about learning something new? Or do I already think I have the world figured out? You know, on the scale, I, I'm supposed to be a teacher. People introduce me all the time as a teacher. I don't feel that way. I, I feel like I'm learning all the time. And when I get asked that question, I try to keep myself at a 10 of openness on a scale of one to 10. I'm ready to learn new things. So as you look at, uh, you look at this, I'd like to speak about three things specifically. Um, the first thing is... Uh, is to talk about what money might be. If I ask you what money is, someone might say, what's well, this piece of paper in my wallet? Uh, maybe it's a, a credit I have in my bank account. Maybe it's a unit of measure. Maybe it's what I have at the grocery store. Maybe some people think money's gold or Bitcoin. But, but the, the, the idea that there could be a revolving idea around what money is and what we perceive it is, is a notion to ponder uh, if you want more of it. You know, there was a time where maybe we thought money were seashells. And when money turned into maybe from seashells to feathers or something else, uh, someone says, well, that's not money. Money's seashells. And as there was a revolution of what money was and what it became, the people who were close to that idea were behind and the people who were ahead of what money might become had a leg up on everybody else. Uh, here's a question, and, and I'll leave this out here without any of my judgment to it. But in 1971, in America, when Nixon took us off the gold standard, there might have been one group of people saying, well, the dollar is no longer money because gold is money. And other people might say, well, no, actually, uh, you know, this, this dollar is money and gold is no longer money because it's no longer attached. You know, which is, is there a revolution here? Should I cling to the gold? And I'm a gold bug. Or should I look at things like that? So 
being open to a discussion of what money is and pondering do you know most people i would imagine have a self concept of well i know what money is i know what it is i have it in my wallet you know i want more of it i i made you know 100,000 of these last year or a million of these or however many you made maybe you have this concept of money but if you were open to the idea that it could become something else that there could be a revolution you may be ahead so my invitation is for you to challenge yourself to say, well, am I open or close to what the idea of money is? Do I know everything about it? Am I complete in my education? Or are there things about money, its history, its nature, how it evolves and revolves that I could learn? The, the second thing I would invite you to consider is what is credit? And credit is an interesting thing because it empowers people. Credit, uh, if, if you have no credit, you get to buy things with work that you've already done and been compensated for. But if you want to get something sooner than that as an accelerator or get more than what you could get with your work uh, as a lever, you could say, I'm going to, to, to acquire something now uh, based on a promise of, of the work or, or value I can give to the world in the future. And what that does is as a, as a producer of goods and services, if I enable people to be able to buy my things on credit, uh, I can sell more because that becomes real money to me. It's money they still, it's, it's value they still have to create in their own lives. But the moment I get that, that's real money to me. So there is a huge incentive in business um, for people to imagine a real estate market that demanded you buy your house with cash with work you've already done, as opposed to an arrangement uh, to buy a house on, on work and value yet to be, to be uh, produced. And, you know, the opinions and dogmas on credit is something that I'll, I'll invite you to think about uh, the same question about money. Is there room for you to learn about credit? Is there room still in your education to learn about what it is and how it works on a big scale? And, uh, and it is fascinating because what would happen to the real estate market if we said no more credit? And so if we can transition from a, from a society that's, that's based on cash to a society that's based on credit, what are the ramifications for that? Now, some people will say credit is evil and credit is bad. That's dogma, isn't it? That's someone saying it's bad. That's, I won't you know mention names like Dave Ramsey and Susie Orman by name by any chance, but... But uh, if they say well, it's bad, it's bad, that's dogma, okay? So we're not going to label it good or bad. We just want to say, well, what is it? And maybe it's like fire. Maybe it can burn your house down. Maybe it can heat you, heat your home and save you from hypothermia. Maybe it can cook your food. Uh, maybe you smoke it and, you know, you cancer, whatever. Um, fire is just fire. And whether it's good or bad might be on how it's used. So I'd invite you to think about money. And I invite you to think about credit. And, and an openness in a different way. And then the third is, do you know what the future holds? That one might be a little easier one to be open to. Um, you know, what is the future? And so the value of having someone like Richard Duncan on the program, this will be a longer podcast because there are three things to think about that impact you as a person, uh, particularly, and it might be over the next six months, it might be over the next few years. When we think about printing money, you know, people thought, hey, get, stay out of credit, stay out of debt. Smartest thing you could have done uh, 30 years ago is borrow as much money as you possibly could and gone in debt as far as you could and bought real estate. And if you'd have gone in debt as far as you possibly could and bought real estate or, or other similar assets, you would be more wealthy today with the devaluation of the dollar. You'd been what we call a short position on the dollar. And if a, if a short position means I'm going to borrow dollars, and that's the first of four steps in, in taking a short position, uh, if, you, if a short position starts with borrowing and we, our net worth increases as the liability column shrinks, there's something to learn about credit. And then you have printing money. Uh, people are going to say, well, credit is bad. Well, credit is only bad if you can't pay it back. And printing money is only bad if you have inflation that's not under control. And so how you think about printing money and how you think about credit, if you have a negative connotation on those, ask yourself, are, what, what skill level do you want in being open to new ideas as opposed to being closed? What, what, 
what posture and context do you want to have? So with that long introduction to set the stage, um, there are three things that, that, that we might hunger for is a better knowledge of money, a better knowledge of credit, and a better knowledge of what is likely to happen in the future, those three things. And so with that context, I, I thank Richard for his patience uh, because we're going to dive into the book because if you feel that you'd like to have a better understanding on those three topics, you can do this for a very minimal investment of uh, time uh, to pick up uh, a copy and invest some time in reading The Money Revolution. So with that, this was not something you wrote. Uh, I've known... Uh, Richard for a long time. And I know that this isn't something you cranked out in, you know, oh, let's write a book three months. Uh, how long, in fact, this was years in the making. How long have you been working on this book to get it perfect? Andy, this book took four years to write. It would not have taken that long except for COVID. The book uh, was 95% ready to go when COVID erupted. And that meant that I had to rewrite a couple of chapters and also just wait for a while to see how things would turn out in terms of the economy and the government's debt and what the Fed would do. So that, that delayed the book very considerably. Well, at least you were able to get paper uh, to print it on because as an author myself, the biggest challenge right now is just get the supply chain of getting paper to write the book on. So uh, this book is divided into three parts, and you might have gotten a clue on what these three parts are as I, as I set the stage. The first chapter, part one, is called Money. Uh, tell us about that a little bit, because there's quite a, I, in my writings, I do the same thing you do. If, if you understand the history and you understand the narrative of how something got to where it is today, it's a huge foundation on which to build on, yes? Can you talk a little bit about part one? Yeah, so part one is a history of money. Part two is a history of credit. So the first two parts are history, going back roughly 110 years. And the third part uh, draws on the lessons mm. from that history to make recommendations about what we can do to make the future better. So when, when we when we speak of history, it's nice because now you're speaking of facts. This is what happened, right? That's right. Part one is a history of the Federal Reserve from the time that it was created in 1913 up until the present. And it tells the history in a very unique and precise way. It doesn't talk about this Fed chairman said such and such in 1932 and they raised interest rates by this much in 1987. What it does, it tells the history of the Fed by analyzing changes in the Fed's balance sheet. Yes. By looking over 10 consecutive periods, how the Fed's liabilities changed and how its assets changed. Now, changes on the liability side of the Fed's asset uh, balance sheet, changes in liabilities, show exactly how the Fed created money. Yeah. And changes on the asset side show exactly how the Fed used the money it created. And, and I would recommend people to not only understand this in the book, but part of Macro Watch, it, it is the best unfolding of this narrative and story, story from the beginning to up to where we are now that I've ever seen. Uh, in terms of the balance sheet. And it tells the story. It was interesting because of what I've learned from Richard. It's funny, one of the charts that I build at the St. Louis Fed is I follow four accounts. Uh, they have four accounts that are the largest. They have the, uh, the account that tracks money in circulation, which is a liability. They have deposits by large member banks. They have the reverse repo market and they have the, the U.S. Treasuries, you know, checking or savings, however you want to say it. And the evolution of those four accounts, even, I mean, you want to get the whole thing from 1913, but particularly, uh, particularly from uh, 2000, 2008 is a, 
is a is is a fascinating thing for for me to to look at. I think the the idea of how this has grown has been something else. So continue. Right. So for example, the first um, chapter uh, provides the reader with everything they need to know about how the Fed works, mm -hmm. why it was originally created, the uh, task it was assigned to do by making loans or uh, providing credit through acquiring bonds. And it explains all the jargon that normally makes understanding the Federal Reserve difficult. Yeah. So chapter one just spells out everything very clearly, what the Fed does, how it does it, what its tools are. And then the, the following chapters look at uh, consecutive periods. The first period covers World War I, what the Fed did to help the United States finance and win that war. The next period covers the, the years from 1920 to 1930. And then the next one is covering the Great Depression, and then yeah. World War II. And then the period out between World War II and when Bretton Woods breaks down. And then the period after Bretton Woods breaks down right up until the time of the crisis of 2008. What's interesting, just to, to interject, what's interesting is to watch the evolution uh, on a timeline through the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve in terms of notes, in terms of gold, in terms of deposits. And you can see the decisions they make in a timeline, and it builds a, a tremendous uh, context of knowledge moving into you know what the Fed used to do, what it does now, uh, how things have changed, how their powers have basically expanded. I believe fascinating stuff in indispensable education. Yeah, so the Fed was designed to be a relatively passive institution yes. that that uh, <laughs> would just intervene to prevent banking crises They're a last resort right yeah over time largely as a result of responding to crises like the world wars or the crisis of 2008 or the pandemic we we're living through uh, the fed uh, developed new techniques to manage monetary policy and in the process it became enormously more powerful today the fed is the world's most powerful economic institution. That, that's, that's important for our international listeners. I was given a podcast or a uh, webinar a, a couple of nights ago, and someone typed in the chat window, why are you talking so much about the United States uh, dollar? Why, why not talk about you know, other currencies? And certainly other currencies are relevant or they wouldn't exist, but the U.S.'s position that is really the legacy the Bretton Woods times of the legacy of having that position, the tentacles of the dollar are part of what, how things run still. Now that might be under threat right now, but your statement you just made that the Fed is the most economically influential, I think, or powerful institution in the world, that means study it. That means, that means learn about it. If the Fed were a corporation, it would be the most profitable corporation in the world. It makes more money than Apple last year. Yeah. And yeah. it's the US government's most powerful policy tool. So it's, it's crucial to under, if you want to understand how the economy works, you need to understand that the government is managing it at the macro level and it's managing it through the Fed primarily. And so if you understand how the Fed works, then you'll be much more well positioned to grasp what's going on around you in the economy and to make better investment decisions. Yep. Fabulous. So you take us through up through Bretton Woods, the breakdown of Bretton Woods. I think, I think one of the most fascinating charts I look at is I look at the, those four accounts that I mentioned and, you know, we had about seven to 800 billion dollars or billion dollars in currency and circulation. You mentioned the, the passive nature of the fed, how it was supposed to design to be more passive than active. And, and in, the, in the idea of creditism, which is, I think, it, uh, you know, there's capitalism, and I think you, the person I give credit for coining the term, that there was a revolution from really capitalism to creditism. And uh, fascinating that, that, that to, to, preserve, uh, to, to preserve the economy, to keep it from crashing, 
we essentially doubled the money supply in US dollars and took the balance sheet from maybe $800 billion to nearly $2 trillion in less than a year. Now, think about that. From 1913 to 2008, nearly, you know, you're five, four or five years short of a hundred year period to get the first trillion. And now you have a doubling to two trillion. And then, you know, so if it takes a hundred years to get it there, and then you double that, then in four more years, you double it again. And then in COVID, you double it again. So the, and, and the powers of what they would buy, you know, with borrowed money or, cre- or created money, I should say, um, the repo market has exploded. Uh, government spending has exploded. It's a new time. So now the third part is the future. We'll talk so about- Let me say a bit more about uh, the real, the moment when this money revolution, as I call it, occurred. The thing that unleashed this revolution was in 1968, uh, up from the time the Fed was created in, in, and began operating in 1914. And between then and 1968, it was required to hold gold to back all the money that it created. And um, it did. But in 1968, it no longer had enough gold to issue any more money. That would have meant that it couldn't create any more money. And, and so it, Congress changed the law and, and they it, removed that requirement. And, and afterwards, the Fed was no longer required to hold any money, uh, any gold to back the dollars that it created. And wasn't it rather inconvenient? Let's say I'm a, a country like France and I, I see the, the Fed is supposed to, you know, these notes are supposed to be redeemable for a, a amount of gold. What if a country like France decides, okay, give me the gold? In other words, they, they basically call on that note, right? They basically lay the claim on, on that gold. It does not exacerbate the problem as well. So you have a need for more money faster than you can mine and find gold and put in Fort Knox and the Federal Reserve in New York. But you also have countries that can make a call on the note, yes? Redeemable right. on demand. That's right. And um, so there were so many dollars overseas at that point in the late 60s and early 70s, uh, the, under the Bretton Woods system, it specified that other countries had the right to convert their dollars into gold at the rate of $35 an ounce. But the US just simply didn't have enough gold to continue doing that. And so in 1971, Nixon said, sorry, we said you could, but you can't. And afterwards, foreigner governments couldn't convert their dollars into gold either. And so at that point, there was no longer any connection whatsoever between money and gold. And that's the thing that truly unleashed a revolution that entirely transformed the way our economic system works. There are three big things that happened as a result of that, that changed our world. Uh, First of all, and most obviously, afterwards, the central banks were free to create as much money as they wanted. Before, they couldn't. They had to have gold to to back the money they created. The second thing is, since the central banks were free to create as much money, that allowed the governments to have much larger budget deficits and borrow more money than they had done before, because they could twist the arm of the central bank and make them print money and buy some of their government bonds. So this allowed the governments to run bigger budget deficits. For sure. Now, normally, big budget deficits and lots of money printing would lead to very high rates of inflation. But something else changed as a result of dollars no longer being backed by gold. The thing that changed is the US didn't have to pay for its trade with gold anymore. It didn't have, if, before, if it had a big trade deficit, it would have to hand its gold over to the countries with the trade surplus. And so it, America's gold supply would shrink, the money would shrink, and the economy would go into severe recession, and the US would stop having a trade deficit. But after we were no longer required to back dollars with gold, the US discovered that very quickly that it could buy enormous amounts of goods from other countries and pay with paper dollars or treasury bonds denominated in paper dollars. So beginning in the early 1980s, for the first time, up until then, trade was in balance. Starting in the 1980s, it became unbalanced. And by the middle of the 80s, it was three and a half percent of GDP, the US trade deficit. 
which was entirely unprecedented. But by 2006, it was 6% of GDP. And that was $800 billion in that one year alone. And the significance of this is the US discovered it could buy things from other countries with very low cost labor. So they started running a big trade deficit with countries like China and Vietnam and Bangladesh. And, and this was very deflationary. It drove on prices. That's really important for people to understand is as you tell a narrative, you might look at it in terms of period. Well, here was a period of war and a period of peace, or here's a period of inflation or a period of deflation or depression. But what, what is important to keep in mind, and tell me if I'm talking out of turn, but what is important to keep in mind is you might visualize two forces that coexist at the same time inflation forces, deflation forces, and they arm wrestle each other. And, and for example, we just mentioned globalization. If I expand my labor force uh, to the world, there, there's more competition now or, or less competition locally for jobs. I now have a greater amount of people I can read. Hey, if someone's one, willing to work for less than you know, a minimum wage in the States, I now can produce, I can purchase labor cheaper, deflationary. Technology, if I look at my cell phone and all the things my cell phone does, um, a video recorder, a GPS device, a camera, a phone, uh, hundreds of apps, things that would have I would have had to purchase individually at astronomical prices in the 80s, uh, in, in the, you know, after the millennia, in the new millennia, these things are, are for pennies. And so technology is a deflationary force. And so the Fed can, the Fed can get away with, I should say, more aggressive uh, monetary policy or more accommodative monetary policy because there, is a de- there are deflationary forces in the world. Is that a, is that a can, can you correct or improve upon that view? No, that's exactly right. One of the benefits, uh, advantages I derived from living in Hong Kong in the mid 1980s was I could travel across the border into China. And there I saw factories for as far as the eye could see full of 19 year old women earning $3 a day. Yeah. And it was completely obvious, given that, that this was going to be extraordinarily deflationary. Yeah. And it was going to lead to growing U.S. trade deficits. And it was going to lead to the hollowing out of the U.S. middle class who yeah. would lose their manufacturing jobs. And that's exactly what happened, ultimately leading to a political uh, division in the country that we're now experiencing. Uh, so, so this changed everything. And- can, I, can I add one thing to your middle class thought as well? Is not only did employment change, but if a person is seeking money and, and uh, there's an inflationary force on money, if a person's seeking money um, and they put that in their bank account, uh, their wealth is shrinking. If a person is seeking, uh, seeking assets, real estate, stocks, uh, their wealth is growing. And there is a wealth gap that is created based on what people are after every day. So if you're looking for a job, it's gonna to be tough because they're gonna get jobs in China because they don't have to pay as much money. But even if you do get the job and, you, and you're, you're seeking cash and stowing it away in the mattress or bank account, the inflationary nature of money uh, makes you poor. And it is only when a person gains the education to purchase assets uh, that they have an opportunity to escape any inflationary force. And, and I, Richard, I really believe that people's hunger for money rather than a hunger for assets has contributed to the shrinking uh, of the middle class as well as the labor. Interesting. Yeah. So anyway, continue. So, um, so the world changed. Suddenly, the central banks were free to create as much money as they wanted. This enabled the governments to borrow and deficit spend on a much greater scale. And they could do both of these things without causing high rates of inflation because globalization was driving down prices. And so the inflation rate in the US came down from the double digits in the early 1980s 
to zero not so long ago. And as the inflation rate came down, interest rates came down. And as interest rates came down, borrowing became more affordable. So borrowing exploded. Yeah. Total, credit, total credit in the US exploded. That's the topic of uh, the second part of the book, credit. Total credit in the US, and by that total debt and total credit are two sides of the same coin. So you can think of this as all the debt in the country, government debt, household sector debt, corporate debt, financial sector debt, all the debt. It first went through $1 trillion in 1964. By 2007, on the eve of the financial crisis, it had expanded 53 times to $53 trillion. And now it's $90 trillion. So in my lifetime, credit has expanded from $1 trillion to $90 trillion. And this credit completely built the world we live in. Absolutely. Absolutely true. And it pulled hundreds of millions of people out of poverty around the world. And it drove up asset prices and stock prices. And it, in fact, it became the main driver of economic growth in the U.S. It, it, and, and I want to go back to what we talked about uh, before we began the conversation in the book is that credit enables uh, purchasing power. It drives gross domestic product. It drives people's ability to spend. Um, if you're smart, you know, our, there's a there's a company where I had my first real job at 12 years old. I got in my Sunday suit and I walked down to a furniture store down the street from where I lived and it was called RC Willie. And what was interesting about RC Willie is they dominated the Intermountain West in terms of furniture. And their manager, Craig Nay, took me under his wing a little bit and he taught me something and he they had these old green screen computers back then that barely, barely could do anything with MS DOS. And he said, Andy, I want to show you something. And none of their profit came from furniture sales in cash. In other words, their prices were so low because they basically gave the furniture away at the same price they bought it at. There was no margin, but they offered in-store credit. It, was a, it, it wasn't popular to even have a Visa or a MasterCard, but they offered in-store credit. And they were the third largest lender in my home state of Utah behind First Security Bank and Zions Bank. They were the third largest lender in Utah. It was the enabling of people to buy on credit that created a, a, a production in their company and Warren Buffett came along and he saw that and he understood that and he bought him, he bought him out. And so now that company is owned by Warren Buffett. And the reason Buffett bought it is because they're delivering a, a, a relatively low price, but they allow people to do it on credit and that allowed them to dominate the space and for people to have the furniture that they have. So that's a small micro example of how credit empowers buying. Well, if you take that to 90 trillion, you have a world where we can have all kinds of things. Is that is that a fair simplification or an oversimplification maybe? Yes. The thing is, is this now our, our economic system has become so addicted Dependent. to credit yeah. yes. that if credit grows by less than 2% adjusted for inflation, we have a recession. And, and if it contracts, we have a depression. In other words, R.C. Willie can no longer run their business any other way and remain competitive. They've created an environment in the furniture industry that now you need other derivatives, perhaps even, to gain a advantage. In other words, it's part of what they do now. There is no going back. If they were to try to go back, their business would fail. And so th there's a dependency on credit now. It's an essential market. And uh, you're you're dealing you're you're playing with fire a little bit to your benefit. A fire heats your home. A fire cooks your food. A fire scares off the bear. Uh, it can also burn you. So it becomes a little bit more of a volatile environment, I think. So it's an interesting thing. Please, this is a amazing conversation, Richard. Uh, we thank you so much. Well, tell us a little bit more about the addiction to credit. So the government understands that if credit contracts, there's going to be a severe economic crisis. So in 2008, the, the private sector, the households had subprime mortgages, 
and the whole thing started to blow up. They couldn't repay their, their debt and credit started to contract and uh, the banks all started to fail. And they would have failed if the government had not jumped in and started borrowing trillion, having trillion dollar budget deficits for four yeah. years in a row. Yeah. So it was the government, when the private sector couldn't borrow anymore and keep credit expanding, the government jumped in because it had to, to manage the economy to prevent it from collapsing into a depression. So it was the government borrowing and the, the Fed was able to help out. Normally, if the government borrowed $4 trillion, $5 trillion over four years, as it did, that would have pushed up interest rates. But the Fed just printed money and bought about half of those new government bonds yeah. so that it financed the government's borrowing with newly created money. And this allowed the government debt to increase, that, that allowed credit to keep growing in the US. The Fed financed it with money creation and it didn't create high rates of inflation after 2008. Yeah. What we saw then was between 2007 and 2014, when the third round of quantitative easing ended, the government borrowed about $7 trillion and the Fed created $3.5 trillion to finance that borrowing at low interest rates. And the highest rate of inflation we had during that period at the CPI level was just 3.8% because globalization was so deflationary that it was driving down prices. Correct. This is really important. So if people can imagine, just imagine kind of a, 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 an idea of three tiers, cash, credit, and money creation. The people came home from World War II and they had lived through the depression, watched their parents starve where money was in short supply. And so these people are savers. These people said, look, I, I knew what it was like. You know, my grandfather would pick dandelions to eat and go home and boil and make dandelion soup. They had the money. Was, I read my family history, which was very well kept. And the poverty in which my great grandfathers and my grand as adults and my grandfathers as children grew up in is heart wrenching to observe. They had nothing. So these World War II type guys. They're, they're about saving money, sticking money under their mattress, sticking money in their safe, just money, money, money. What, what's, so, so that's one tier. Another tier is the idea of credit. Uh, baby boomers, you know, we grew up with credit cards and RC Willie credit accounts and, you know, credit. But then you have a third tier of money creation. So the, the risk of credit is an inability to repay and default. And you fix that by printing the risk of printing is inflation. And we manage that by analyzing deflationary forces. And, and that's a whole different ball game. So you can print as much money as you want to and feed as much credit and pay off as much credit as you need to, so long as the inflation is managed. And so some people would poo poo credit, but that's how real estate people build their business. That's how you know, people sell their products is based on credit. And yet, if you can't pay back the credit, the credit, the, the economy will die. And that is what would have happened in 2008. We had defaults, we had an inability to pay back. And so we printed money to take care of that. Yes. So now the real question is, is inflation and deflation, those two forces, you know, how, how it's a totally different, it, 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 the money revolution is a beautiful title, because things revolve, they do revolve. So tell me about the, the, the positives, because a lot of people think, oh, money printing, you can't, like there's a dogmatic reaction to just printing money out of nothing. It's like, because we can't do it, because a business can't do it, the fact that government can do it rubs us the wrong way dogmatically. It's not right to uh, just create wealth without exchange and value behind the wealth, right? A dollar used to be, a claim on gold that was valuable, you know, you had something. Now it's a claim on credit or, or basically a, a keystroke on a ledger. And people intuitively and dogmatically say that can't be. Can we speak to the necessity of money printing because of the necessity of credit? Can you speak to that? Well, so I really appreciate what you said at the beginning about keeping an open mind and not being dogmatic. So many people, most people are 
of course, influenced by the kind of economic theory they were taught at university if they studied economics. And even thinking back to what they've just learned from um, conventional wisdom. These are dogmatic debates. You have, you know, it, just as you have Democrats and Republicans, you have Austrians and Keynesians, right? You have Austrian economics and, you know, Germany who went through hyperinflations. No question, Austrian economics would be uh, just from a, a visceral, emotional standpoint of what they went through. Uh, you have Austrians, you have other people who are Keynesians, and it's so, it is dogma. It's like two religions almost comparing notes uh, of who has truth. It's fascinating. Well, so these various economic theories, many of them were correct and appropriate for the time in which they were created. For instance, what we think of as classical economic theory, all of that theory was built on the premise that gold is money and that you couldn't create any of it. Yes. So all of the laws of supply and demand and everything that is built on classical economic theory is all built on that cornerstone that gold is money. But gold is not money anymore. Once you pull that cornerstone out from under that theory, the whole theory collapses. And the Austrian economics, for example, was uh, in part uh, developed by Ludwig von Mises, his yep. big book came Mises. out in 1912. Yeah. Um, and it, it argued that yes, these credit bubbles occur because there's too much credit, but you get to the point where you just can't expand credit anymore because there's only a limited amount of gold to support that credit base. But that was true then, but that's not true now. Now, because of the evolution in our economic system that we've been talking about, and because we can now have a global economy that is so deflationary, what we have found ourselves in now is a situation where, again, after 2008, the government was able to borrow $7 trillion in seven years, and the Fed was able to create $3.5 trillion over that time to finance that at very low interest rates, and there was no inflation. The, and the feeling of running a business and running a household is there's just a tremendous amount of pain in running a deficit in your household. And it is the end of your business if you do it in the business. So we have a labeling of deficits as a negative, deficits of bad, under the rules which a household and a business has to operate. And so when someone who lives in a world of deficits being uh, devastating to, I mean, it's financial cancer to a business. The cash flow, if you have a negative cash flow, cash flow going out of your account, you're running net deficits. You're, you're, you have an hourglass uh, of time that is running out. Your household will go bankrupt or your business will go bankrupt. So when a, some, someone in that context sees a deficit of the United States today between 2.4 and $2.7 trillion deficit, and the astronomical nature of that numbers, they can't help but feel uh, financial Armageddon is nigh because of the context of their household and their business, yes? Yes, so the second part of the book is a history of credit, the evolution of credit and the impact it had on the US economy over effectively a 100 year period. And it, it, credit, it looks at the explosion of bank credit the explosion of credit by the broader financial sector, including the likes of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and the issuers of asset-backed securities. Mm -hmm. And it looks at the credit that foreign central banks created and pumped into the United States. Uh, in 2007, foreign central banks had provided about 8% of all the credit in the United States. And that was money that they, pure, that they created. And so this, this explosion of credit that's... Uh, the subject of chapter uh, part two, it caused the nature of our economic system to evolve into something different. You know, it's not capitalism. Capitalism evolved into what I call creditism. Yes. Capitalism was uh, an economic system where businessmen would invest and some of them would make a profit. They would accumulate that profit as capital, savings and capital, hence capitalism. And repeat, it was quite difficult but that's not the way our system works anymore. It evolved into a system that's driven by credit creation and consumption and more credit creation and more consumption. Now, no one planned for this to happen. This revolution occurred 
once the break between dollars and gold occurred. Yes. That unleashed all of these the, you say, natural was, forces that were held in check. It was, it was unchanged, right? The it gold was, was the ball and chain. Yeah. Unfettered. The golden fetters were broken yeah. and credit slipped its leash and our entire global economy was transformed. And um, that history is the topic of part two. How frightening, how frightening, how frightening is it? The, 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 perhaps what's a bigger deficit than a $2.7 trillion deficit or $2.4 trillion deficit? I'll tell you what a bigger deficit is, the education deficit. That this happened with, with, with people with, I mean, in, in civics, you grow up in school and in your civics, you learn checks and balances between maybe a legislative branch to create a law, an executive branch to enforce a law, a judicial branch to interpret the law. You might learn about uh, the, the Congress types of processes of a bill going to the president uh, to be signed into law. You might learn that stuff, but there's a complete absence, a complete absence of a knowledge of monetary policy in the world, complete absence. And so people join whatever capitalistic or socialistic groups they want to, and they do so in absolute darkness of understanding the history of money, how it works. And so there's a, there's a, a passage, I think it's in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy or something that says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. And if a person wants to navigate this new world that, that happened in 1971, gaining knowledge is the first order of business to study because without knowledge, how does a person navigate if their map is incorrect? How does a person live in a world that's round if they think it's flat? And if you live in a world where you think it's flat, how do you navigate if the world now is round? Well, if you live in a world of, of capital, rather than a world of credit, and then to, to the next level, the world of, of money creation, how do you position yourself without a map that is accurate? It's fascinating, Richard, absolutely fascinating. And it's why I advocate strongly uh, for the book, Many Revolution, from the standpoint of education. It is not a rhetorical book, uh, like many, pe many people will write a book with an agenda. It is simply an informational book of this is what happened in history and, and how we might navigate. It's, it's great stuff. So, so you have an explosion of credit. It, uh, it is unleashed from the, the, the restraints of having to create gold to create money. And, and here's what's interesting. Anything can be overstepped. Now, I'd like your opinion on this. And if I'm going astray, guide the conversation back to where you feel it should go. So my instinct tells me to, to, to go here, but if, if it's too early or if it's not where you want to go, bring us back to center. But when Spudnik, you know, flew, or flew around the world and people saw Spudnik, it created a space race. And there are races uh, all around the world to get to the moon first, so to speak. So Russia and the United States became the two leaders in the space race. Okay, we have different races today. I think this race for AI is something that, like, there's certain wars you can't afford to lose. You can't afford to lose World War II. You can't. You can't lose World War II to Hitler and, and Germany and Japan. It's just not an option. And if it, it doesn't matter what kind of borrowing needs to happen. It doesn't matter what kind of money printing needs to happen. Look, you fund the war. Build the tanks. If you haven't earned enough money uh, to build those tanks, then borrow the money to, to build them. And if you haven't any credit left and any money left to pay those loans, well, let's print money and create a you know, debt to GDP ratio of you know, 200 if we have to. We have to win the war. We got to get to the moon first. We got to land on the moon and plant that flag on the moon first. Well, what about the race for AI? And what about the race to solve healthcare? If you have $160 trillion in promises because you have to take care of people's health and diabetes, well, maybe the way to, and you only have a $24 trillion GDP to do that with, 
maybe the way to do it is to eliminate that obligation by curing cancer and diabetes and extending life for more work. Maybe if China has a billion people to your 350 million, maybe you better print some money so you can invest in AI because whoever gets to AI first rules the world. So it's, uh, am I too early on that type of stuff? No, that's the, um, this is the perfect place to bring, bring that up because the, the third part of the book, the final part is called the future. And as I mentioned, I wrote most of this originally in 2018 and 2019. And what I was looking at at that time, the history of the last 100 years of the evolution of money and credit, this is what I saw. I saw the US government had created, gone into debt through its budget deficits of $7 trillion in seven years, and the Fed had financed half of that by creating three and a half trillion dollars from thin right. air. Right. And it didn't cause any inflation. 3.8% inflation was the peak in 2011. And by early 2015, the inflation rate was negative for the first few months of 2015. We had deflation again. So drawing on that lesson, I, it seemed to me that what we need to do is to have the government borrow and invest aggressively in new industries and technologies on a very aggressive scale, large enough so that we could, you know, a multi, what I propose in the book is a, that the government fund a multi-trillion dollar investment in new industries and new technologies over the next 10 years, targeting things like artificial intelligence, quantum computing, genetic engineering, biotech, nanotech, robotics, and uh, renewable energies and a multi-trillion dollars. So I don't put a specific price tag on it. I wrote that we should, the government should invest as much as possible as quickly as possible. And if it causes high rates of inflation, then they can rein in the investment for a while until the bottlenecks causing the inflation are overcome and then reaccelerate the investment program again. If the government were to invest on a multi-trillion dollar scale, we truly would have a very good shot at curing all the diseases. I mean, for instance, the, the American, the Cancer Institute, the National Cancer Institute, its budget is $6 billion a year. Well, recently, very recently, quantitative easing was $120 billion every month. Yeah. So 6 billion is 5%. Their annual budget is 5% of a month of quantitative easing. Right. Now, we're not curing cancer, but we could if we expanded that by 10 times, for instance, or, or 20 times, throw, a, throw one month of QE at curing cancer, and we'll cure cancer. So, as I said, this was, um, but then this was an open and shut case as far as I was concerned the benefits of investing in this way would have been, would be so extraordinary. And it would be so easy to, uh, as I show in chapter 19 and 20, it would be so easy for us to afford to do this, that it would be criminal not to. Then COVID happened in yeah. early 2020. And globalization took a big uh, step back. Massively inflationary, near shoring. Uh, People are feeling this. I, I wanted to order some new patio furniture. And so I went down to a, uh, I didn't go to RC Willie, <laughs> but I went to a different place and I found this wonderful chair. You know, I'm a large man and I found this wonderful chair. I said, I'll take it. And they said, great, 14 months out. <laughs> and so the prices are through the roof because you can't get anything. And so the supply side uh, is, is, is down. And this is a great thing to talk about because the question is, will you know, we have a, and then we'll, we'll get to the war in Ukraine as well, but this COVID is a tremendous lesson and example in the inflationary and deflationary nature of, of globalization as, poor, as opposed to compartmentalization, uh, to produce things within your own borders is different and and even within the own borders it was tough to get labor so it, extremely deflationary and like so so here we go and like 2008 
these deflationary forces makes makes it tough to make ends meet. All of a sudden, paying rent doesn't happen. And so we say, well, people shouldn't have to pay rent. So now if I'm an investor and I need to make a payment on, I mean, the real estate is credit. So if I'm an investor, like my real estate income dried up, um, my personal single family homes that we rent kept flowing, but the syndications I was a part of just halted immediately. And I thought, when, when will the government help these guys? And so there had to be, it felt to me very much like 2008, that to keep things from crashing, there was never an idea of deleveraging or unwinding the Fed's balance sheet. It's just the rate, what rate of expansion is necessary. Yes? Yes. So the government, again, just like in 2008, they responded with yeah. extraordinarily large budget deficits. Historic. They, they borrowed, um, well, let me use this. The largest budget deficit ever before then was in 2009. It was $1.4 trillion sure. for the whole year. In April of 2020, in that one month alone, the government borrowed that much, $1.4 trillion in one month. Incredible. And for that quarter, that quarter, the three months, they borrowed $2.8 trillion in just three months. And over the last two years, roughly, they borrowed $5 trillion. And the Fed has created four trillion new dollars to finance that government borrowing at low interest rates. Uh, roughly, almost eighty percent of the government borrowing has been financed by money creation by the Fed. But this time, we do have inflation because COVID has caused global supply chain bottlenecks that just keep going and going and going. First, we had the original strain of COVID. Then we had Delta. Just when that was fading, we have Omicron. Omicron, Omicron spreading all around China. They're, they've shut down Shanghai for a month. It's in Beijing now. And no telling how many cities are going to be shut down if China continues to follow its zero COVID policy. Right. Now, there was good reason to be hopeful that the global supply chains would be overcome by now. But COVID has made that not true. And then just at the time when it seemed possible that the inflation rate would start dropping, Russia decides to invade Ukraine. And that creates another huge shock to the, to the system. Oil prices, gas prices shot up, wheat prices because Ukraine exports so much wheat. 40% of the wheat, it comes from Ukraine and Russia in the world. I mean, they almost have half of it. There's a lot of land there in Russia. Very types of metals that those two countries produce, yep. another huge blow to globalization. So this globalization where this high inflation, the highest in 40 years, this is resulting from a setback in, in globalization. Now, hopefully COVID will end and the, those supply chain bottlenecks will be overcome. Hopefully Russia pulls out of Ukraine and the world begins to go back to normal. If that's the case, then I do believe globalization will uh, once Resume. again become the dominant force and in, in the, the dominant factor in determining the price level, pushing down prices again. And if it does, then the sort of investment program that I have advocated in this book once again becomes possible. On the other hand, who knows? We could have many more rounds of even worse deadly COVID and the war in Russia, the war in the Ukraine could spread to other countries this could permanently be the end of globalization in a worst case scenario, in which case what I've advocated in the uh, book to invest in new industries and technologies probably won't be possible, or at least it won't be possible without high, higher rates of inflation. If, that, if that's the case, we'll then have to decide how high inflation we're willing to live with to prevent China from becoming the do dominant global superpower and uh, having us at its mercy because it develops artificial intelligence before we do. Yeah. Or differently, we'll have to decide how much inflation we're willing to live with to cure cancer and to expand life expectancy by another 20 years. Would you put up 8% inflation a year if you could live an extra 25 years in great health and we could cure all the diseases? That's something we could discuss. But if globalization returns, then the we could finance this investment program 
in new industries and technologies on a multi-trillion dollar scale without having any inflation, just like we got through the crisis of 2008 with no inflation. Well, what becomes interesting in this brave new world is if we if we unfetter and we we use the the power of the printing press you know money is power there's no question you put money behind something you have a legitimate force to push things money is power there, there's just no way around it you you can take a mass through a distance at an accelerated rate when you have money behind that you can create power so what what then happens is a fight for that money and it, it is it is interesting because now the people say well let then and, and i'm not a conspiracy guy i just know that when i go to the gas pump there's more and when i look at a chart i believe it's probably i mean when the fed says we have a balance sheet you know closing in on nine trillion around that i believe that that's that's a lot of money but you think of someone who says you have a person who says well i don't believe in global warming you have another person who says i do believe in global warming Okay, that's a Spudnik moment, right? Do we need to get to the moon first? There were people that said we didn't need to get to the moon first, right? There's people that say, well, we shouldn't go fight the World War II. There's people, there's political, and now we talk about policy out of, out of monetary policy now grows, you know, different types of policies. So if, if Bill Gates is right in, from his book that uh, the biggest thing faced in the world is global warming, then you got to print your way to high heaven and people are fighting. They're going to fight for that money. Well, I can do it. I can do it. It creates incredible things because there's no shortage of problems in the world and human beings like the idea that suffering is no longer acceptable, right? I mean, you, the, the idea of losing your house uh, is a capitalist idea. The idea of losing a business is a capitalist idea. The idea of letting an, uh, you know, a, a company fails a capitalist idea because they were too leveraged. So they couldn't pay the penalty of, of the reason I believe we have moved from capitalism to creditism is the idea of too big to fail is we're not willing to endure the pains of a crash in 2008. Uh, if we had not printed the money, there would have been a tremendous amount of pain uh, felt we're not in a world that is willing to endure pains of any sight, any words now cause people trauma. Uh, it, you don't have to be a person that went through Auschwitz and write a memoir about your time in Auschwitz to explain what trauma was. Now trauma is a Facebook post to somebody. So the, the idea of what is strength now, what is weakness, what problems are dire, what problems are not, because there'll never be a shortage of problems. So let me ask you this. There is a limit to what earning can do. There is a limit to what credit can do. We needed credit to surpass the, the, the limits of earning. We needed printing to accommodate the limits of credit. Are there limits to how much we can print? And how does a person judge that? Because a savvy investor will use debt effectively in the at the household level and at the business level without running those deficits they still have those constraints but if i believe in the bernanke put which has now become the fed put what type of responsibility will i have now as an investor if i realize that if if the fed put is real if we see every time there's an issue the fed will print their way out of it then what's what are there any constraints uh, for me as an investor and businessman anymore on the type of credit risks I should take. So the reason I recommend this book is we live in a different world than we did in the 1960s and even the 1970s. Uh, there's so much to talk about. What are the limits of printing? How do you, how do you gauge? It's pretty easy to see the limits of credit because I think, what can I pay back? But how do you gauge the limits of credit or of money expansion, current currency expansion, money supply expansion in terms of its limits when inflation becomes no longer endurable. How, how do we decide that stuff? It's good. It's fascinating to think about. So inflation is the real uh, killer. Yeah. Without inflation, the sky is the limit. And for example, yes, in terms of government debt, 
relative to the size of the economy. Japan's government debt to the size of its economy is twice as large as the U.S. government debt. Are, are they at 250 or are they closing on 300? I haven't checked that for a while, but I know they've been above 250 for probably a decade. Yeah, it is it's above 260 now. Okay. Whereas it's, the U.S. is 130% of GDP. Right. It's government debt to GDP. Right. In terms of the, the central bank, how much can they print? The total assets of the Bank of Japan relative to Japan's GDP, their assets are four times larger than the Fed. So the Fed's total uh, assets as a percent of G US GDP, is about 35%. Japan's total assets, Bank of Japan's total assets to GDP, 120%. So I, in, this, in this book, I show that if the government, I don't, as I said, I don't put a price tag on how much the government should spend, but I use $10 trillion to illustrate what that would do to the government's budget deficit and the Fed's balance sheet. And just to make my point more dramatically, under the assumption that every last penny of that $10 trillion is wasted over the next 10 years, that would take US government debt up to 150% of GDP right. 10 years from now. Where, that's where Japan's government debt to GDP was 20 years ago. And it would take the Fed's total assets to GDP to 60%, which is half of where Japan is now. So this just illustrates how easy it would be for the United States to finance this if all we're worried about is just the financing. If we don't have to worry about the inflation, we can definitely afford to do, to do this. It's the open and shut case. Uh, as as your readers of the as readers of this book will see, these things are important to learn about because you look at now that opens the door for political discussions on on uh, you know what are human rights right what are well globalization you know what does that do to you know you mentioned the endless factories of teenage women you know toiling away at three bucks a day. How does this play into the argument for universal basic incomes? How does this play in the argument for uh, social programs? How do we, because if we, if we take a position that we can now be relatively unfettered, where the sky is the limit, politically, it is an incredible time of revolution. I mean, it, everything will change. Uh, but I'll ask you again, how, you, know, you, you don't put a number on it but someone has to, right? I mean, you can say, well, 10 would work or 20 would work. That is there, first of all, is there a limit? I believe there, there probably is a limit to what you can do because you can only, you can only put out this, uh, you can only print money and create inflationary force to the degree that it is kept in check with deflationary force. And of course, there's a finite number of people in the world in terms of globalization. It isn't universalization, it's globalization. So there, there is there an economic calculation a person can make that says, okay, where do we top out with globalization where that no longer is a deflationary force? Is that an unlimited de deflationary force? Obviously not, it's a finite number. What, what do you think? I think that the challenge of the Fed is they're driving a car <laughs> and they see, they see a, a, a something happening and they say, well, let's turn left. And so they turn their wheel left, but it doesn't respond in real time. They have to wait and see if they overcorrected or if they didn't do enough. That's a heck of a challenge. Uh, Jerome Powell says, well, this inflation is transitory. We're falling below our 2% target. You know, we, we're free to crank this up to stay with our 2% target. But all of a sudden you're, you're, you know, if you look at the PE, you know, the, the personal expenditure, uh, the PEC index, personal consumption expenditures, PCE index, you know, like you say, it's the highest it's been in 40 years. Obviously the Fed didn't think the transitory inflation was gonna be that big. So how do you speak to whatever the limits are? I think that's the real key because inflation is the thing that would kill it. And we have seen, different economies throughout the world hyperinflate. Hyperinflation has precedence as well. So how do you answer those people? And what do you say to the people that says, well, there has to be a limit somewhere, or is that just more dogmatic thinking? Well, I, sure, th there are limits. And the biggest limit is 
the biggest danger is if globalization truly breaks down for whatever reason. Sure. But if globalization persists and recovers, then we have such a large population of the planet, and so many of them live on such low wages that I can't sure. tell you the precise date in the future, but I can tell you it's generations from now before mm-hmm. we run out of low cost labor. Uh, we haven't even tapped India in terms of a manufacturing base, uh, the way that we mm-hmm. we have China there, and there are you know hundreds of millions of people in India who would work for less than fifteen dollars a day. So there aren't hundreds of millions of manufacturing jobs. So in that respect, I don't think we're going to. That's not the constraining factor anytime within our let's say investment horizon. If there's one thing I hope people are experiencing right now is what is the priority of education on this topic for each individual person? It is so critical as we, as we globalize, as the world shrinks to become smaller policy, you know, politically policy decisions need to be made. So certainly a, a member of an electorate needs to be as educated as they can. It's a civic duty, in my opinion to understand the issues of the day before we cast a ballot for them. But perhaps even more important to the individual is how does one navigate and create a blueprint for their own uh, financial? And that's, that's really, you know, where, where I've, you know, Richard, his space is macroeconomics. Um, His space is here's what I see. Here's, here's the, the numbers globally. My space is how do you take that information Richard gives you and position yourself in terms of what do you buy? Where do you invest? What do you do? And I can't do my job without people understanding what Richard does. I can't. It's, it, is, it is very, very difficult to make personal investing decisions in ignorance. And so understanding the climate and the possibilities, not what will happen, but what could happen is the investor's burden of of preparing a balance sheet and a personal income statement and statements of cash flows to to create a personal plan that navigates the unprecedented unprecedented possibilities, uh, risks, dangers, upsides, opportunities that are there uh, as we've revolved into this new new area. Can we, we, uh, so, you know, amazon.com, uh, the Money Revolution, Richard Duncan Economics.com, uh, Macro Watch. These are all extremely valuable resources to learn more from Richard Duncan. You know, this is a longer pod. I told everyone this is going to be a longer podcast than normal because there is just so much about this topic that is salient for our time. It's, it's, it's a very, in my estimation, it's a very important conversation that is not that should be shared with friends, that should be a viral, if, you, if, if I could use that word, because it affects every living person on this planet. Let, let's talk about this, uh, Richard, the war in Ukraine. Russia has been building up their gold supply. China has been building up their gold supply. I think, I think uh, the United States, and I don't know if these numbers are accurate. I mean, how do you know with a landmass uh, the size of Russia how much gold they've mined and, and, you know, that they have stowed away that we don't know about. But they said Vladimir Putin seems to believe that gold is money. Gold is valuable. He's been acquiring gold as a, uh, as a hopeful backstop uh, to help him financially if he wants to expand uh, Russia and go back to the, the days of the Soviet Union. Can you speak to oil, uh, natural gas, and gold as commodities? and the role they play, uh, because at the end of the day, what does real money buy? Well, it buys commodities and the manufacturing and combination of those elements into products and services we use. So we still need resources. We still need silver and oil and iron and coke and steel and copper and fish and oranges and trees and lumber. Uh, All of the things in the stuff of life, the chemicals for plastics come from commodities speak to oil and gold uh, and Russia, if you would. What's your opinion on Russia and Vladimir Putin's hoarding of gold? So 
let me talk about oil. That was one of the three you mentioned. Uh, there's a wonderful book, you've probably read it. It's called The, the Prize. It's the history of the oil industry from the time it was first pumped out of the ground. And, and that's and, really how the, the world runs on oil. I mean, we have wind and solar, but 80, it used to be 86% of our, of our energy came from fossil fuels. With all the Green New Deal and all the green stuff we've done, we've got it from 86 to 84. With all the investment we've done, we still the world runs on oil. So let's start with that premise, right? The world runs on oil. And the big takeaway from this book, I believe written by Daniel Yurgen, I think is how you pronounce his name. It's a very famous book. But the takeaway for me was it's from the beginning, it has been wildly volatile in price. You know, the term peak oil was originally coined in around 1870 when they thought the oil was running out in Pennsylvania. And the price of oil shoots up and then it collapses, it shoots up, it collapses. Yep. This happened again and again. So two years ago, the price of oil was minus $40 a barrel. Yeah. And, and now a few months ago, it was $140 a barrel. So I do believe that oil's days are numbered. We will have an oil-free world probably within this generation uh, as renewables. You know, it's, we are going to find a way to harness the solar power. We'll have more solar power than we need. Well, if you, look at, if you look at Bill Gates and his book, what's interesting, and the environmentalists won't want to hear this, but the technology of Chernobyl <laughs> is, it was you know, way old. And the, uh, you know, even, even cancer treatments have changed. They're much safer and less taxing on the body than they were, you know, 30 years ago. Um, but even, you know, if you read Bill Gates' book, the, the technology, he's, you know, when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So with Bill Gates, technology solves all problems, right? We can make nuclear safe. But you mentioned that, that you know, that's an interesting statement you've made because, on one hand, we've said, well, globalization in terms of labor will be generations away. You're saying that energy independence from fossil fuel fuels is less than a generation away. That's an interesting timeline because when 84% of the world runs on oil, uh, you know, and, and with wind and solar, the issues you have is periodicity. I mean, sometimes you have a cloudy sky, sometimes you have a clear sky, sometimes you have wind, sometimes you don't. Nuclear is is on the table as well. I don't advocate for it. I'm not educated enough on those topics to take a position, but but that would change. That would that would very much change the world if if they became independent of fossil fuels. I mean, that's a totally different world. Yes. Yes, and of course, the kind of multi-trillion-dollar investment program I'm advocating in the money revolution would accelerate that. I, I think, you know, I make this case for this investment. I believe there are three really important reasons that uh, we must invest. The first is because our economic system demands, requires credit growth to stay out of crisis. And if the government were to borrow and invest on that scale, that would produce the credit growth necessary to keep the economy out of recession, to keep creditism out of crisis. That's the first reason. The second reason is because we're about to be overtaken economically, technologically, and militarily by China for one reason. China invests more in research and development than the United States does. That's why they have 5G and hypersonic missiles, and we don't. Well, and, and they also they have AI. They so, also have an advantage in that they're going to have, they don't have regime change every four years, right? They can, they, they, they don't have uh, privacy laws. I mean, you go to China. And you have a, you know, they're, they're tracking your cell phone charging habits to create a social score for, I mean, your credit report and your credit score is based on not your financial life, but other factors and algorithms in AI. When you have a society, you know, AI is fed on data. The more data, the more data you have, the more the computer can learn and the more accurate the out, the larger the sample, the more accurate the conclusions generally. You know, if you have a poll of three people or take a poll of a billion, you have better data with more. 
And the fact that China does not have the same respect for privacy, or I mean, they're very socialist. Uh, they'll get all the data they want, whether you like it or not. Just look at Shanghai right now in their lockdown. We have a zero COVID policy and, you know, we'll take your baby from a, from a, the mother and there's nothing you can do about it. So they have a huge advantage in marching towards AI because they can force the collection of data. Would you agree? I mean, they, they have a, a numerical advantage, a military advantage, and they also have a, an advantage in data mining towards AI. I mean, I think they have a huge advantage, a, a head start right now. Doubtlessly true that totalitarian regimes have some advantages, as you have just described. The problem is, is when the totalitarian leader goes senile, the way <laughs> that Chairman Mao did, resulting in the starvation of roughly 30 million people when I was a child in China. So things are great with, when you have a capable dictator yeah. with complete control over the, the entire economic system until right. he goes mad. Right. Uh, and there's a lot of ways to go mad. I mean, Vladimir Putin, maybe he's not senile, maybe he's crazy like a fox, but he's certainly, uh, he's certainly causing problems in the world right now, right? Are we seeing that in Vladimir Putin? Perhaps so. But uh, so the final of the three reasons I think we must invest is because this kind of investment would produce such extraordinary breakthroughs. It would induce a new technological revolution. As I said, we would have a real shot at curing all the diseases, expanding life expectancy, uh, rehabilitating the environment, and solving most of the other problems we're confronted with now. And it would be so easy for us to afford to do this. We could so easily afford to do this. Now, as I said, inflation has caused my book's thesis a very big problem. But on the other hand, the fact that the government was able to borrow $2.8 trillion in three months with the Fed financing nearly 80% of that, I believe helps support the argument that this, it demonstrates how easy it would be for us to carry out a multi-trillion dollar investment over a decade. They borrowed 2.8 trillion in three months. Right. I'm talking over a decade. That illustrates how easy it would be. So we must invest because of the extraordinary benefits that we would derive from it and because we so easily can't. It's a moral imperative. We must because we can. It is an interesting idea. I love, I love your term investment as opposed to printing because the printing finances the debt, which finances the investment. It, it, it's just a matter of derivatives. And it, it is just a fascinating book, a fascinating conversation. You and I have talked about this over the years. Can you speak personally to your own revolutions as you've studied economics? Have you, have you ever felt like you've broken out of a dogma that you've been in you know, we all see ourselves as rational. I mean, if I take a poll of, of people and we know that, that on a scale of zero to 100, we can rank people on their ability to drive and their proficiency in driving. And we know that there's a median point of people. And so we say it would be impossible for, for everyone to be in the upper half, right? Or for more than 50% of the people being the upper half. But yet if we ask people in their own self-concept, where are you as a driver? far more than 50% put place themselves in the upper half. So we know that there is delusion uh, in our brains. We just believe it's not in ours. It's in everybody else's, <laughs> right? <laughs> Have you had, what are the epiphanies you've had as a, as, as a lifetime student of economics? What are the epiphanies you've had? And have you had any major changes in how you've thought about the world? What are, what are the big ones, if any? The first big epiphany was understanding that globalization would be so deflationary and the consequences of that. But in terms of, I've already discussed, but in terms of changes in my beliefs, yes, I have had a very important one. My first book was written about 20 years ago, The Dollar Crisis. Yeah. It, it was, came out in 2003. It was updated two years later, 2005. It argued that big global imbalances in the world we're creating a, a big credit bubble in the United States. Yep. And that just like the Austrians taught, every credit bubble would pop. And when it did, it would throw the US into a great depression. 
and be the end of the dollar standard. I said the collapse of the dollar standard would be the, the uh, most significant event of the 21st century economically. Well, so this crisis that I predicted, I really believe the book predicted that crisis very accurately. In 2007, everything started to collapse. 2008, Annie Mae and Freddie Mac went bankrupt. AIA, AIG went bankrupt. All the banks started to fail. Burns, Lehman, yep. But what I failed to anticipate was the effectiveness of the policy response. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have been surprised if that the government would run big budget deficits. But what surprised me was quantitative easing. I could not imagine that the Fed would be able to create three and a half trillion dollars in such a short period of time without that leading to extremely high rates of inflation. So I just didn't even conceive of that. It seemed inconceivable. But when they did, and when it worked, then I had to change my views. It, it, is, it was possible. We saw it was possible. The Fed financed half of the government's $7 trillion of borrowing. And rather than the economy collapsing into a Great Depression, and rather than the dollar standard falling apart, they, they reflated the economy. And the dollar is uh, re rebound. The dollar is quite strong right now. I haven't, I didn't look at the chart before our, before our call started, but I read today that the dollar is very close to hitting, the dollar index is very close to hitting a 20 year high. I will need to verify that, but it's certainly strong. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at, uh, I can bring those charts up readily and let's just look here. Different, different metrics. I mean, the, the value of a dollar can be measured. You, everything about the dollar is relative, right? I mean, is it, is it high, you know, as opposed to stocks? Is it high as opposed to gold? Usually it's measured against other currencies. You know, how is the dollar doing against the euro or the franc? Um, but it's an interesting thing. Yeah. Now, um, the yen is definitely at a 20 year low relative to the dollar. The, the euro is getting weaker and weaker because you're in such, such trouble. But very so much. anyway, I did have to change my mind. Uh, the, and afterwards I thought, okay, well, if we are living in a new economic environment where it is possible for the government to run trillion dollar budget deficits and it's possible for the Fed to create trillions of dollars, and let's maximize this new economic environment we're in and use it to invest in new industries and technologies on such a large scale that it couldn't possibly fail. What's really, what's really interesting as a, as a fundamental analyst and you know, a technical analyst, you know, if you ask me about, now we go from maybe less of a macro view to, I don't know, this isn't a micro view, but I, I see personally a, a tremendous detachment uh, from asset prices from what we call fundamentals. In other words, the, if, if you're an investor, what you're really buying is a box that makes money. That's really all you're buying is, I picture it as a cash flow jack in the box where you turn the crank doing whatever work you do. And you know, when the song ends at the end of the year, money either comes out or it doesn't. You know, pop goes the weasel and cash comes out. So the amount of, of you know, uh, the, the competition that exists for investors is we wanna say, obviously, which jack in the box can we buy uh, how much you're willing to pay for a dollar, you know, throughout the last 120 years, the median that investors have been willing to pay adjusted for inflation is about 15 bucks for a hundred years. It's been like that. We'll pay a, we'll pay a, we'll pay $15 to get a box that makes a dollar at the end of the year. And after 15 years is paid for itself. That now is sitting close to 40 where we're paying $40 for the S and P to create a dollar. So we're spending 40 bucks. And part of inflation happens when you have an abundance of money to buy. And so it's going to, and so the, the thing I would advocate for Richard's book is for people to read and, and decide how you want to use this information and navigate your own financial uh, balance sheet. When I look at Warren Buffett and I look at how Berkshire Hathaway is positioned, I think it's, it's a model. Because I see him almost, I, I wish I could speak to him about it. I see him positioned actually very well for both inflation and deflation. A person doesn't need to choose one or another. You can prepare for both. Now, you won't be maximized, obviously. I mean, if I believe my house is going to burn down, I would double up on insurance. 
if I leave my house is not going to burn down, why waste money on it? So being totally one way or the other, if you're right and your house never burns down, all that insurance was a waste of money. If it does burn down, it's the best investment you ever made. So I would advocate for people to become educated so you can take the position of preparation rather than prediction. I, poor Richard, you know, the, the burden of being an economist is everyone thinks you have a crystal ball, <laughs> right? What's going to happen? What's going to happen? And I think the smart person reads as much as they can and prepares for, uh, for, every, for the scenario that no one saw coming. I think Richard made a great point. I felt the same way. I bought a bunch of silver uh, when we started printing all this money because I too, I said, there's no way you can print this. Type. You can't double the money supply from 800 billion to 2 trillion without inflation. I just could not see it. And sure enough, um, we, we rolled that snowball up the hill. Do we have to keep expanding though? That's that, what, what's frightening is we, we have to keep expanding and we have to keep expanding at a certain rate uh, to, to keep going. And the exponential nature of this expansion, anyone who understands you know, exponents, boy, it, it gets tough to expand in orders of magnitude when it's exponential. Any thoughts to that risk of uh, sustainability uh, when you're expanding exponentially? As the Fed's balance sheet obviously is. Yes, uh, you're, of course, it's a concern, but there are long-term concerns and there are short-term concerns. We have to live through the short current term concerns first, because yep. if, 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 if credit were to contract, say during the pandemic at the peak of the lockdowns two years ago, and the government hadn't responded, then the Americans wouldn't have had any money to pay their mortgages or their car payments or their credit cards. And so uh, they wouldn't have, and all the banks would have failed and credit would have contracted, and we would have collapsed into a Great Depression, and that would have dragged the entire world into a Great Depression, and we'd be living through the 1930s now on our way to the 1940s. So I'm not, I don't believe our civilization can, can survive that. Therefore, what we need to do now is think about, given that our economic system requires credit growth to survive, we need to think about how to use that credit growth most productively to bring about a sustainable future that we can survive in for generations to come, and also to shore up U.S. national security for generations to come. It, it's an it is a there's an acceptance to diabetes when you're diagnosed, let's say with type one diabetes. They say, look, you need insulin, and you're now dependent on insulin. And if you don't get that insulin, you'll you'll die. It's a, it's a funny feeling to think about um, you know, monetary policy. If you use a metaphor of medicine saying, look, we are addicted to this money and we're now dependent on this money. And we're not only dependent on that, we're depending on taking increased doses over time. And someone says, gee, that doesn't sound healthy. Well, whether it's healthy or not is not the issue. It's whether or not you need the insulin. It's the immediacy of the insulin, right? If you need it, you need it. And that's just the reality. If you had a disease that required not only insulin, but more insulin every week, uh, what are you going to do? Not do that? You're going to perish? And I think it goes back to uh, World War II. You know, what was the United, what's the highest, if you go through Richard's chronology, uh, the highest debt to GDP we've ever had in this country is World War II. We're not an all-time high in that because the necessity of the immediate problems to be solved trumped uh, the, the, the idea of, of you know, too much credit expansion. It was a risk you had to take to survive. Um, is that where we are? Is that, is that a fair metaphor? Is that grandiose? No, that's, I think that's exactly right. This situation we find ourselves in now where we're dependent, addicted to credit, it didn't happen in the last five years or the last 20 years. It's something that has been that happened over many decades. No one planned it. Uh, this wasn't some conspiracy. This is just how our economic system evolved. And again, with the major turning point being when dollars ceased to be backed by gold in 1960 yep. and 1971. Yep. It just evolved. Position. 
We've had an amazing discussion, a long one, but it's, I, I just cherish my time with you, Richard. I cherish our friendship. I've, I've learned so much from you. You have been one of the people that have been a tremendous spur to me as a, as a person who didn't, growing up, I, you know, people, people that knew me in high school and knew me in uh, junior high and saw my grades and my interest in reading books, uh, they would no longer recognize me. <laughs> They'd say, how in the world? Andy can't put a sentence together. He can't even spell, let alone read and type. But you have been one of those people in my life that in listening to you, particularly when we were in Singapore, in Asia Minor, when I listened to you, I said, you know, there's things in the world I want to know. I want to learn this stuff. I don't want to be in the dark and I want to do everything I can. I love my family too much not to try to be as prepared. And I guess it's the Boy Scout in me. And, and you know, knowledge is life right now. I mean, education is life. Uh, right now because the world's revolving. So we've been speaking. One one, one other thing that we have never discussed before. It just happened since we spoke last that uh, I find really encouraging. You know, many people think that what I'm advocating, the government funding of a multi-trillion dollar investment program is just never going to happen. But in fact, it is already starting to happen. Uh, In just a few months ago, Congress passed Uh, a law called uh, the America Competes Act, allocating, this was the House of Representatives, allocating the American Competes Act, allocating $350 billion for investments in new industries and technologies, including $52 billion in semiconductor manufacturing in the United States. And this follows on a similar law passed by the Senate last year called the U.S. Innovation and Competition Act, which uh, allocates $250 billion for new industries and technologies, including $52 billion for semiconductor manufacturing in the United States. So this is a big step in the right direction. Both houses have passed this similar laws now. They're going through reconciliation and soon they'll be signed by the president. So it's not a trillion dollars, but $350 billion is a big good step in the right direction. And it shows that the US government does rec- and the reason that this has passed is because they're afraid of China. Oh, that well, is the biggest with, driving force behind these laws. With good reason. Uh, um, with good reason but not the only reason we should invest. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, I just wanted to mention that to you because I'm very excited that this is actually happening. Uh, they are investing in new industries and technologies. They name artificial intelligence and all the other things that we've been talking about in this conversation. So that's a that's great news. Uh, it shows that this is a possibility. It shows it's already begun to happen. Why uh, right now the Fed's going to raise rates fifty basis points? Um, they're worried about inflation. What 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 what's in the mind of? I mean, I can't you can't know what's in the mind of Jerome Powell and his colleagues. But are we going to see more aggressive policy to curb inflation? Or I mean, the debate really right now is in is the inflation transitory because of um, you know, globalization being slowed or, or reversed a little bit because of COVID? Or, you know, that's the debate. Is this wave of inflation transitory? Or is it the, the beginning of we have, you know, we have printed too much? I mean, why is if it is transitory, why is the Fed raising rates? Well, you could phrase that question another way. Is it caused by global supply chain bottlenecks or is it caused by too much stimulus? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, if it's caused by too much stimulus, the stimulus is, is all going away. The last big stimulus was in March last year. Yeah. And so there's not, there's a, there's not going to be any more fiscal stimulus. Right. Uh, when we talk- there's a, there is a difference between, and let's be clear, what you're talking about is the difference between stimulus and investment. The stimulus could take the form of investment. I'm just talking about big government budget deficits. Right. Last this involved a lot of uh, checks being sent to Americans uh, in the mail so they could just spend the money any, any way they wanted. Right. But that stimulus has, has ended. And when we spoke last year, Uh, We were expecting big infrastructure bills and build back better bills and all kinds of new spending bills. But most of those have fallen through, or at least it doesn't seem they have much of a chance now. And secondly, the monetary stimulus 
has ended. The Fed is no longer printing money through quantitative easing. They dialed that down very rapidly from $120 billion a month to zero. Now, they're just about to start reversing that through quantitative tightening. They're going to begin destroying dollars on a multi-billion dollar scale soon. So the, the, the other element of your question was, what's the Fed going to do and why is it going to tighten if it thinks it's transitory? Well, the Fed has to be seen to do something, even if they think inflation will go away. And they don't, they don't no longer know that it will because COVID keeps going on and on. And now we have the war in Ukraine, which could intensify. So they don't know the inflation is going to be transitory anymore. Um, it could get worse. And even if they thought it was transitory, they still have to be seen doing something. They can't just sit back and not keep interest rates at 0% with 8.5% inflation. So they are going to do something. They're going to hike interest rates by 50 basis points yep. on May 4th and probably at their next meeting and maybe at the meeting after that. The federal funds rate is going to be up above 3% before long. And worse still, they're going to start destroying hundreds of billions of dollars through quantitative tightening. They're talking about $95 billion a month of dollar destruction, roughly three or four, starting gradually, it's say maybe 30 billion the first month and then 60 billion, but $95 billion of destruction pretty soon. So we could be looking at the Fed destroying roughly a trillion dollars between over the next 12 months, which I think is about 14% of all dollars. And if you own stocks and own real estate, that is something to pay attention to. Yeah, uh, if you look at a, 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 if you just overlay the the S and P five hundred over the Fed's balance sheet growth, there are some interesting correlations there. Uh, Jerome Powell tried to reload the gun in terms of what I mean in, by reloading the gun is if you're at zero, that's one policy lever that's maxed out, right? You can go negative, I guess, but but if you're policy, you know, if you're zero, what do you do? So in attempts to reload that gun, uh, the market suffered. And he said, well, we'll go to patience, if you remember that, that phase. So it will be interesting to see how the markets deal. Because I, I really believe that if you're going to expand credit, you've got to expand money supply. And, and so it's a fascinating time to be alive and to be interested and to be engaged in learning these things that we've been speaking with my dear friend, uh, and, uh, and teacher Richard Duncan, his new book, uh, The Money Revolution, How to Finance the Next American Century. It has a section on money, a section on credit, and a section on uh, the future and what uh, could be done or might be done. I recommend it for the education. He also has Macro Watch. Macro Watch, are, as you say, it's, it's uh, consistent videos where economics events are explained and his passion is to make macroeconomics as, as simple and, and MacroWatch is a vigilance idea. Uh, and then here at the Cashflow Academy, you can go to investingwebclass.com. You know, we're here to help you. And we have free web classes to show you how we create passive income uh, from you know, assets like stocks and manage these risks that we've discussed. So check out the free web class, investing.class.com. That's a resource. Check out richardduncaneconomics.com. Uh, go to amazon.com for uh, the money revolution. And uh, it's just been great. Any final words before we part? Thank you for so much graciousness. You know, he, Rich, Richard lives in Thailand. So he's going into the night as I'm going into the morning. <laughs> so he's been very gracious. Uh, any final thoughts for... Uh, for potential readers of the book? Well, two thoughts, and these more for in investors, actually. You know, and the markets and investors have grown used to the Fed jumping in and supporting them every time the stock market starts to fall. Bernanke puts, yeah. Maybe that's not going to be the case this time, because up until now, the Fed needed the stock market to go up to create wealth and to drive the economy. Well, the economy is relatively strong at the moment, but the big change now is we have high rates of inflation. Yep. So the Fed, if stock prices fall, wealth will be destroyed. That will, that will reduce purchasing power and that will cause inflation to drop. So the Fed needs inflation to drop. So they may not be so fast to jump in 
uh, this time. So buying the dip this time may turn out to be a big mistake because the Fed might like to see stock prices fall quite sharply. And that's the closest I've ever heard you come to, uh, to uh, laying down a possibility of what to do. That's pretty good. I'm proud of you. <laughs> just, something to keep, just something to keep in mind. It is a possibility that, uh, what, that up until, until now, you can pretty much count on the Fed, but I'm not sure you can now. You know, that, other, that's a great and, comment. Great comment. I would, I would like to offer your listeners a 50% discount to MacroWatch if they, if they would like to subscribe. Oh, fantastic. If, if they go to richardduncaneconomics.com and hit the subscribe button, they'll be prompted to put in a coupon code. If they use the coupon code April, like the month of April, they can subscribe at a 50% discount. So I hope they will check that out. And while they're there, they can at least sign up for my free blog to see the kind of work I'm doing. Richard, thank you so much. I wish you and, and yours well, uh, health, happiness in, in uh, Thailand. And uh, I hope we get to, to have you back soon, my friend, as, as these things unfold. Thank you so much. Andy, thank you so much for having me back on again. I can't uh, wait until the opportunity arises for us to meet in person. Sometime. It's been a while. Yeah, it's been a while. It's time to get on a plane. They don't, uh, time to get on a plane and meet up somewhere. So we'll, we'll do that soon. Uh, be great. You, you've been listening to Cashflow Academy podcast where investing is made simple. My guest has been Richard Duncan, a dear friend and a brilliant um, economic student. And uh, we hope you enjoyed this lengthy conversation. I think it's an important one to have. Uh, I hope it spurs you to take some action, to read new things, experience new things, uh, seek out new education. And we'll see you next time. You've been listening to the Cashflow Academy podcast with Andy Tanner. For more information on investing made easy, go to thecashflowacademy.com.